are you from? Alabama. Alabama. Paris, France, originally. Paris, France. Oh, I'm, I'm the enemy, England. English. Oh, okay. Where are you from in England? Well, a place called Norfolk. Norfolk. Okay. Yeah. That's where we live. Yeah. That's where most of our settlers came from, actually. Norfolk, Suffolk, Essex, and Kent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Southeastern England. First of all, welcome. Welcome to Boston and to Fanel Hall. Fanel Hall is owned by the city of Boston. We at the National Park Service have been invited in to tell you about the history of the building. My name is Mike Bradford. I'm a former park ranger. You can see me resplendent in my uniform. <laughs> and, uh, I've been here for 26 years, so now I'm a volunteer, though I'm retired. So, we begin with our eponymous ancestor over here. Peter Fannell is his name. This place is called Fannell Hall. Why? After Peter Fannell. One day in 1740, Peter Fannell came down here and said, this place needs improvement. It was an old dock, town dock, that was almost 100 years old. It was built in 1642, so it was getting kind of old. So he he proposed to improve it with his own money. Now, he was the richest man in Boston, and so he could afford it. But, uh, and he had a good time with his money, don't get me wrong. He was known as the Jolly Bachelor, but he was also very generous. So he proposes to do this all by himself. He's going to build a nice, neat, one-story brick marketplace. Couldn't care less about politics or anything like that. Now, that would be uh, considered a reasonable suggestion. You're, um, you're building a building from which food is sold. Who could possibly object to that? Well, they did. In Boston, uh, they debated this matter for 80 years. Why ever would they do that? Boston at the time, you have to know a little bit about Boston. Now, Michigan is partly a peninsula, right? Well, Boston was a peninsula, too. It was only a mile and a half square, originally. A little smaller than Central Park in New York. And it was connected to the mainland by a narrow neck. And beyond the neck was the mainland, and on the mainland were farmers. So at any one time, no Bostonian was further than a mile and a half from the nearest farmer. Now, to be sure, if they wanted produce, they didn't go down to the farms. You met the farmer at the neck. The farmers would set up their farm stands on the neck. So uh, they said, why, why do we need a marketplace? Another reason they gave was that the, um, if, if the building were built, then, uh, and the farmers were forced to sell from that building, and they'd all conspire with each other and raise prices, see? So for all these and other reasons, they objected to a marketplace. So Peter Fennell had hard going, actually. He offered his, made his offer at a vote in the town meeting, and the, uh, the vote was very close. 360 people voted against it, and 367 voted for it, so it just squeaked by, actually. But the building was built at last in 1742. Originally built, stretched only from the center aisle here to the south wall, a very narrow building, 40 by 100 feet. Now, Peter Fannell, right from the very beginning, knew of the controversy, so he offered from the beginning to add a town meeting hall above the marketplace. And so that's what he did. When the building was finished, marketplace below, town meeting hall above. We won't talk about the markets today, but remember they have just as long a history as the, uh, as the town meeting above it, even though that's more famous. <coughs> So what happened when the building was finished in 1742? Nothing much below. People are still opposed to the market, so only one lone man in the beginning rented space in the, to sell something. On the other hand, the town meeting hall was used immediately, but uneventfully, the usual business of the town meeting for the next 19 years. Then unfortunately, something exciting happened. The building burned to the walls on a cold day in January in 1761. So we are left with an empty brick shell. But uh, the building was rebuilt in 1763, and at the rededication ceremony, James Otis, a member of the town meeting, and one of our most famous early patriots, dedicates the building to the cause of liberty. Now, cause of liberty, what is he talking about? Remember, this is 13 years before the Declaration of Independence. It's 12 years before the American Revolution would even begin, so he's not talking about independence, and he's not talking about revolution. He's talking about a form of government known as the town meeting. It still exists today. It's nearly 400 years old, and it is a direct democracy. If you folks want to hear the talk, you go all the way, all the way over here. Sit right there. Plenty of empty seats right there. Where are you folks from? Taiwan. Taiwan, okay. And I'm from Boston. Okay, have a seat. Thank sir. you. There we go. All right, so 
The town meeting. What is the town meeting? Town meeting is a direct democracy. If you go to a small town in New England, you will find no mayor, no head person, no city council, no town council, no township form of government, government from the county, or anything of the sort. By the way, respect to our gentleman from Norfolk, this, this uh, form of government was brought by the pilgrims and the Puritans, who mostly came from southeastern England, it's called East Anglia, counties of Norfolk, Suffolk, Essex, and Kent. And so it didn't exist anywhere else in England, even in their own time. So therefore it wasn't imported to any place else in the colonies. The only place you find it is in New England. Now, people in the town meeting get together and vote in their own laws and taxes. How would you like to do that? <laughs> Think about that. <laughs> would that make you a, a flaming liberal or a rabid conservative? Would you come from a blue state or a red state? I believe the town meeting did several things to the people of New England. First of all, it made them think about government. Why would they think about government? If you vote in your own laws and taxes, what are you? You're directly involved. You're the government, okay? So they think about government because they're the government. They ask themselves big questions about government that people with representatives don't ask themselves, like, what is government? What should government do or not do? How far should it go? And so forth. So we, in respect, sort of uh, honed ourselves very sharply on the on the very on questions about the very purpose of government. Secondly, in the town meeting, they learned to stand up and speak. How many people here like public speaking? Oh, we've got a couple. Okay, very good. All right. Um, well, it's kind of scary, but um, if you want your uh, opinion to be heard in the town meeting, you must stand up and speak because nobody represents you. You are your own representative. And in reality, New Englanders became practiced at standing up and speaking and expressing their opinion. Read anything about John Adams. He described himself once as obnoxious and disliked. Why? Because with the slightest provocation, he'd stand up and lecture you on the right thing to do and, uh, and give you his opinion whether you liked it or not, see? So any, where did he learn that? In the town meeting. And finally, what do you think would happen to taxes? Would they be high or low? Let's put it that way. Voting in your own laws and taxes. They'd be low. They'd be low. Folks. Yeah, you'd have the lowest possible taxes you could have and still have government function. So consider all these things as we move into the year 1763. What happened in 1763? You can't escape 1763. What happened in Michigan in 1763? Oh, okay. What happened in France in, in 1763? French Revolution. No, 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 it was Germany. Hmm? Um, 1763, the French and Indian War ends. And the uh, Ottawa Indian chief named Pontiac takes advantage of that and begins his rebellion in Michigan. So even if you come from far away Michigan, you see you're still involved in 1763. In France, the French and Indian War has ended. And France has to turn over all of her possessions in North America, leaving only Saint-Pierre and Miquelon. St. Lawrence River, we have a Présence Française in, in Canada, you see. That's the only thing they own, is two little islands in, in the middle of the St. Lawrence River. By the way, I should digress, I'm going to digress and say, we have a very, very great treasure here. Um, we have, happen to have a portion of the Treaty of Paris right here in Boston, and you, you can see it if you want. It's right up the street at the old state house. The Treaty of Paris was signed between France and Spain, who fought together, and Great Britain. And we have directly from the British National Archives one-third of the Treaty of Paris, the French version, so she can read it pretty easily. <laughs> you'll have to struggle through. So I invite you to see it, because you'll, otherwise you'll never see it again in your entire life. So, so um, this, you will notice, happens to be the 250th anniversary of the Treaty of Paris, so we're celebrating that by having the treaty in a 300-year-old building that's still bringing their 300th anniversary over there. But I digress, 1763, what happened? Okay, so Great Britain has won the war, hooray. They fought for nine years to drive France from all her possessions and they won. But it's cost them 15 to 17 billion dollars to do this. Think about that for a minute, 15 to 17 billion dollars. And they tried to recover, they were trying to recover one third of this. They knew they couldn't recover all of it. So one third of it. And so uh, what did they try to do? 
how do they do? Do they go out and get a job? Or? No, they tax. They tax the American people. Now, in truth, most of the Americans didn't mind helping to defray the cost of the war. But around here, we looked at the bottom line. We said, why, these taxes are passed without any permission, <coughs> consultation, warning, discussion, debate, anything remotely resembling what we did in the town meeting. It was right here in this spot, right where we were sitting. It was the first protest were lodged against British taxation when James Otis got up and in 1764, and said the words, what were those words that he said? Representation. Very good, that's the wimpy version that most people remember. I want you to, <laughs> I want you to take this home and, and have the more strength, the, more, the stronger version of it. It goes like this. Taxation without representation is tyranny. Right here in this hall, 1764. So that's the thread that would go through 10 years of opposition to British taxation. Let's pause for a minute and think about what he's talking about. What is he talking about? Taxation without representation is too. What does he want? What does he crave? What does he lack? What's that? A say where? In Britain. Okay. Is that practicable? Where's Britain? It's 3,300 miles that way. Okay. It was early recognized that it was impractical to send 13 delegates, say, to have, their, have them take their place in Parliament. Uh, why? Because even though they were there, they'd be swallowed up in the majority of Parliament. Secondly, uh, they have no cell phones, okay? No way of communicating with their constituents, right? So is there another solution to the problem? Independence, of course. Independence? Bite your tongue. <laughs> Is there a country in North America that remained loyal to Great Britain, right next to Michigan, by the way, and does it have a parliament? What's the name of that country? Yeah. Canada. Yes, so, so you've just settled a problem, see? Now there's no United States. We're one country, all the way from the Rio Grande up to the polar bears. So there you are, and there's no United States. And we're all loyal to Great Britain, right? Of course it didn't happen. So. So, um, they talked about this, though. For 10 years, they, they did hint, hint at this. They didn't talk about it strenuously, but they did hint at it. The protests here go on for 10 years, from 1764 to 1774, and Great Britain doesn't seem to have cared at all what we said in our town meeting, our little town meeting. But when we threw the tea into the harbor, that's, that's a different thing. So they began to pay attention. So they closed down the port of Boston, passing a body of laws called the Coercive Acts. They called them the Intolerable Acts. So Boston's closed, nothing can come in, nothing can come out. Everybody's practically starving. The British soldiers spend their time raiding the islands in Boston Harbor trying to get cows who are pastured there to, uh, for meat. And so uh, the other colonists pay attention to this. They say, hmm, they can do this to Boston, they can do this to the rest of us. Let's meet and talk about this. When did they meet? Where did they meet? Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, that's right. Where in Pennsylvania? Harrisburg, Scranton. And then they met in Philadelphia. Philadelphia. So uh, at Carpenter's Hall, remember this is not a legislative body, so they did not meet in, in what's called Independence Hall, which was actually the state house of uh, the colonial capital of Pennsylvania. So uh, they met in Carpenter's Hall. I've been to Carpenter's Hall. It's a very little building. I was with a large group. I had to squeeze in. It's surprising how, how small a building it is. It was a guild hall for the Carpenter. But this is called, this meeting was very important. It was called the First Continental Congress, right? Now, what are we thinking of? We're thinking continentally. In other words, they're thinking for the first time about something called the United States, you see? So they're thinking about actually even forming a government of the United States. There was a very interesting man there. His name was Joseph Galloway. Now, this is 1774, so we haven't been divided into loyalists and patriots. So he was actually a loyalist, had to move to England later on. But as soon as he came here, he was thinking like a Canadian, which they were not of at that time. He said, let's have a parliament, meaning a parliament here, so we can make laws here. So uh, we'd listen to him. As I say, we'd all be Canadians. But there's a little something that intervened. Uh, in the meantime, it was called the American Revolution. So. Within seven months, the American Revolution has broken out. When that happened, the British occupied this building. 
They put on plays, mostly written by John Burgoyne, the British general. The plays were really bad, though, so they wanted to just leave. <laughs> so they placed cannon on Dorchester Heights, two miles to our south, and forced the British from Boston on March 17th, 1776. So the British leave, town meeting resumed the next year, they would continue until 1822. It's only in that year that Boston finally became a city, nearly 200 years after settlement. So the city stays here very briefly, eight more years, till 1830, and then they leave. So ever since 1830, this building, still owned by the city, has been a hall that anybody could rent. So we've had some colorful characters come through here. We've discussed, debated, or protested every issue that has concerned America, whether it be abolition of slavery, people like Wendell Phillips, and uh, Charles Sumner spoke here. Some of the first people who wished to abolish slavery spoke here. Frederick Douglass. Um, Votes for women were discussed here. Lucy Stone organized surreptitiously a meeting that supposedly was going to uh, celebrate the 100th anniversary of the Boston Tea Party, December 16th, uh, 1873, but she invited all the women in the region and discussed the progress of uh, women, uh, votes for women. Uh, we had discussions on how long the work day should be, uh, or opposition to child labor, in the 20th century, we've talked about the question of abortion and birth control, or what to do about communism. Now, the, now the hall was enlarged in 1806 by Charles Wolfram, this way, and he gave it essentially the appearance that it has today. So therefore, in this very hall, there have been war protests all the way from the War of 1812, all the way up to the, to the Vietnam War. And the hall is still used today, the meetings go on. Today we have such meetings as uh, naturalization of American citizens. Every other Thursday, not yesterday, but the week before, we had uh, eight, 300 people become American citizens in this room. In addition to that, we have concerts. I noticed on our latest schedule, we have several concerts uh, scheduled. There's a group called the Boston Classical Orchestra, and they have concerts from September to May. You have to pay for them, they aren't free, but uh, they're, they're, they call it good music up close. In addition to that, we have uh, such things as, as uh, Spelling bees and graduation of small schools in May and June, and uh, uh, retirement ceremony for military personnel, um, change of command ceremony for the Army, Navy, Coast Guard, book readings, anything that a free people can do except uh, uh, weddings, uh, birthdays, and uh, maybe funeral orations, except for Peter Fells. He died here very shortly after he built the building, so one of the first ceremonies was a funeral oration. But aside from that, um, you can do just about anything you want in Fannel Hall. It's still an open public meeting hall. And you can say anything you want, just the way you could in the old town meeting hall, the town of Boston. And we fervently hope that this will continue for centuries, or even millennia to come. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, it sounds like a French name. Do you know, was it Huguenot or who was it? It was French Huguenot, yes. Yeah, yeah. Faneuil. 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 Very good. You're the only one who can pronounce that. Faneuil. Faneuil. No Englishman could say that, though, so I pronounce it Fanel. 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 Actually, probably funnel during the uh, 18th century.